Welcome to the Developmental Trauma and Attachment podcast and webinar for clinicians. Join us today as Josh Carlson, Associate Director of the Knowledge Center, introduces us to Kara Moon and gains her perspective on mindfulness and its role in the therapeutic process. Hi, welcome to uh, Chaddock's Developmental Trauma and Attachment webinar series and podcast. Uh, my name is Josh Carlson. I'm the Associate Director of the Knowledge Center at Chaddock and the host of the podcast, as well as the trainer of the webinar series. So welcome today. Today's topic is on mindfulness, and I have therapist Kara Moon here with us from Chaddock. So Kara, tell me a little bit about yourself, um, what you do here at Chaddock, how long you've been here, uh, the type of clients you work with. Sure. Um, so I've been here, um, actually this year is year six. Um, I started as an intern um, at the school, so I have a little bit of experience there. Um, then I worked residentially with the older teenage girls um, and then moved over to the outpatient world. Um, I'm a licensed social worker currently working on uh, getting my clinical license, so hopefully that comes sooner rather than later. Awesome. Um, so. Okay. Um, so today's topic, as I mentioned, is about mindfulness. So when you hear the term mindfulness, what does that mean to you in the context of the clinical setting? So mindfulness for me um, when working with my clients is really about them being able to let go a little bit um, of of their struggles to to have to be on guard all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's an opportunity for them to just practice being in the moment, um, being present with themselves, their body, their surroundings, um, so they can just take five minutes um, and not have to worry about what happened before or what happens next. Mm -hmm. um, so taking them out of that um, that hypervigilant state um, and just giving them a moment to just be in the world. So why is that important? Why is it important to give our clients that moment to, to pull them into the present, to fully experience the present moment? What does that do for our clients in, in our therapy rooms? I think a lot of times, um, especially with the clients that I have, they, they can't see what's right in front of them because they're mm -hmm. always worried. They're always trying to think one step ahead. Um, they always have to, um, to be one step ahead in order to protect themselves or to just get through their day. And so by giving them that five minutes um, of just being in the moment, they don't have to think uh, next. They don't have to think next steps. They don't have to worry about um, being uh, two steps ahead of everybody else. They can just be in the, in the safety of that room just, just in that moment with themselves. Mm. Something I really uh, that caught my attention in what you just talked about was safety. So we talk a lot about felt safety. So for you, how does uh, mindfulness connect to that concept of felt safety? I think a lot of our kids don't know um, what it feels like to feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, they don't allow themselves a chance to experience that because they always do have to be two steps ahead of everybody else. Um, and so when working on mindfulness and working on um, connecting themselves with their bodies. They learn what it feels like when my body feels calm and how to help their body feel calm. Um, so if they can feel calm, they can help them feel safer. Okay. <clears throat> so when you are trying to approach the topic of mindfulness with your, uh, with your clients in therapy, how do you go about that? Like, what do you do to incorporate mindfulness practices with your clients and what might you, how do you encourage them to practice mindfulness outside of the therapy session? Um, I think sometimes it depends on what type of client I'm working with. Right now, a lot of my caseload is um, younger adolescents. And so with them, I don't really explain it. Um, I just say, here, we're going to do this thing. I know it feels weird. It feels goofy. I'm going to ask you some really weird questions, but I just want you to go with it with me. Um, typically with my adolescents, I use food to start with, mm. um, whether it's fruit snacks or um, like chips or whatever. Um, so I guide them through a mindfulness activity with the food because it's tangible. They can touch it. They can feel it. They can yeah. taste it. Yeah. And it's not like um, I'm not asking them to do more of the complex, like, you know, take a deep breath in and notice where that breath goes because they can't do that because they're not connected with their body. Right. Um, so I start with an activity that doesn't feel like mindfulness. It just feels like I'm asking you to do something silly with your bag of fruit snacks. Sure. Um, and then afterwards I connect it like, Oh, when you were, you know, when you were noticing all the colors of your fruit snacks, were you worried about the tests you have to take in school tomorrow? And they're like, Oh, well, no, no. Okay. 
you are right here in that. And so we do a lot of education through that way after we do the activity. Mm -hmm. Because then I find um, if I try to explain it beforehand and I'm like, okay, we're going to do this thing and it's going to do blah, 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 blah for you. Then they start to focus so much on what they're supposed to be doing that they lose the experience. Right. So I find that if I just do it and I'm like, I know this is weird, just go with me they get more of the experience because we can reflect on it afterwards. Right. So rather than focusing on doing the activity right, mm -hmm. which then pulls them out of being mm -hmm. present in the moment, we just you, just, you just say, we're going to try this activity out and see how it goes. And with my older clients, <clears throat> um, whether they're adults or they're just a little bit more mature, um, I usually guide them through more of a breathing or I do a lot of like the, the scripted meditation. Mm -hmm. And I say, all I want you to do is just relax into your chair and follow my voice yeah. um, and then we go through and reflect on that process afterwards something you mentioned uh, just a couple uh, moments ago was that kind of using food as that kind of tangible but it, uh, the other piece that came up to me was there's a big sensory component mm -hmm. so we're taking this outside stimulus and putting it into our body and we're allowing ourselves to try to experience that rather than trying to experience like a physiological mm -hmm. something happening like breathing right. or what have you. Um, so last, our last webinar, we talked about sensory. So I think that's great that you brought that up. So um, when, how do you try to incorporate sensory, that sensory experience? Cause we talk about how sensory experience and, and uh, clients being able to, um, or how sensory exposure can help clients calm down. How do you look at sensory experience and mindfulness and how do you mesh them together? Um, I think for, for my clients, I really have to do a lot of the, the mindfulness first. Um, I need to, especially with the kids that are so dysregulated and they need that sensory, um, if I can get them to a place where they can practice the mindfulness and they can do it with me, um, we can move into a little bit more complex or mindfulness experiences um, that because once they know what they're looking for once they know um, kind of like okay how I do this then they can pull in the sensory pieces so um, with some of my clients that have been doing the mindfulness with me um, we take it to the next level and we use more sensory rich things so um, I have a couple clients that I use shaving cream with and so we just put a big dollop of shave cream on the table and they play in that and they tell me what it feels like they tell me what it um, what it smells like, how it makes their hands feel, and things like that. So we can take it to the next level once they have that foundation of, of mindfulness experience. Yeah, okay. So um, the other thing that stood out to me is you talked about um, adding on the psychoeducation of and the application of mindfulness of. So when you did this, were you worried about the test later this week? No. And so you're, you're also taking a moment within the session to show them the application or the usefulness that this isn't just a silly game. Right. That there there are like real tangible benefits of I can use things like this to take a break from the things that are worrying. Right. Tell and me a little I, bit about that. That's a good um, a good segue. I um, especially with my adolescent clients, a lot of their struggles are at school. Um, socially, you know, in the classroom focusing. And so I encourage them once we practice it in session, you know, okay, you can do this at school, at the lunch table, do it with your, you know, your French fries. Notice what they feel like. Notice what temperature they are. Notice what color they are. Notice how salty they are. Um, you can do it in your classroom. If you're in the middle of a test, you need a break for a second. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, look around the room, find all the colors that you can see, find all the shapes that you can see. Um, you know, just take yourself out of, you know, what it is that you're doing and, and find something else in the room to, to, you know, choose something in the room and put your attention there. And so we practice a lot of those things. Um, and then that's how I, you know, okay, this week I want you to practice it one time, you know, at, at school or one time at home. Um, and then they come back and most of them remember and they tell me what they did. Um, some of them forget and that's okay too. We just do more of it in session so they get that experience. Okay. Um, and I think you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but any benefits to our clients using mindfulness that you haven't talked about yet already that, um, that people who are listening to this podcast or might be interested in uh, attending the, the mindfulness webinar, uh, should be looking for like what or why, you know, why should they 
uh, attend the webinar? What what benefits do our clients get because of using mindfulness? I think um, one of the things that I like the most about mindfulness is that it doesn't have to be, there's no set way to do it. Um, you can do it with anything, anywhere, in any environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't, it's not just food. It can be, like, you know, like I said, things around the room, things within your body. It can be um, bubbles or, um, you know, little pieces of candy or gum or mints or drink. Um, it doesn't have to be, there's no hard and fast rule for how to do it as long as you have like the core elements of it. Yeah. Um, and so learning about it and learning how to use it, it's something that, you know, not just our clients can use, but us as practitioners, um, as clinicians, you know, it, it's a it's a helpful tool to just to have in your pocket um, because we all experience, you know, that feeling of like, of, of being overwhelmed and just needing a, a moment to ourselves and a moment to reconnect to the world, um, you know, to, to feel grounded. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps us move on through our day. Um, and so I think, you know, having that understanding of why mindfulness is important and, and how it can benefit us just to have, um, whether you're a clinician or whether, you know, you're just, um, I mean, anybody, mm -hmm. you can, you need it and you can utilize it in any setting. Yeah. So, and I think the important, uh, something that came up of that statement for me was that it's it's not just a benefit to our clients, but it's also a benefit to mm -hmm. us. Especially, you know, that thing about the parallel process that we talk about in reflective supervision. That if we're practicing mindfulness, um, that's only going to strengthen our ability to help them. Uh, our clients strengthen their ability to to do mindfulness, and we're we're wanting them to be able to be more centered and focused on what's going on. So again, if we're using we mindfulness, have we have to do that ourselves so that we can be fully attuned and be giving our clients their best, their our best to them. My favorite thing about doing um, like the guided imagery with my clients or like the guided relaxation is when I am closing my eyes and I am sinking into it mm -hmm. and then I like peek my eyes open and I can see them just staring at me like, "What are you doing?" Like, "I'm I'm at the beach right now. Like, I don't, right. I don't know what you're talking about. And so seeing them mm. um, watch me do it, I think is, is helpful. Um, and, and giving them permission to do it with me. Yeah. Um, and that has been uh, something that I've been noticing with some of my clients. Awesome. So what do you do to support your clients as they're trying to develop these skills? You know, are there, are there certain barriers that you've noticed that, you know, that your clients kind of come to you with and being able to, um, use and, and use it in an ongoing fashion that, uh, are there any ways to help clients overcome those barriers that you found helpful? Yeah. Um, a lot of times for some people it feels silly, mm -hmm. um, or it's really, really difficult. And so, you know, they, they can't take themselves out of that moment. They can't, you know, connect with themselves. Um, and so being supportive in that and not discouraging and letting them know, like, this is okay. Sometimes this doesn't work for the, for some people and let's try something different. Um, another reason why I like how versatile it is because if, if this doesn't work with this client, I can try, you know, if A doesn't work, I can try B, C, D, and E. Yeah. Um, and, and really reassuring them that like eventually we will find something that works for you, something that helps you connect with yourself. Um, and so being really supportive with them and like, this is normal. This is okay. Right. Let's try again. Um, and not allowing them to give up. Um, so every session we either start or end with an activity. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most important things about mindfulness. It's not just something that you like mm -hmm. can do. It's it, practice. It, it takes practice. It takes some time and effort mm -hmm. into being able to util utilize that school uh, or skill, I should say. Uh, what would be your best piece of advice to other clinicians that are interested in implementing mindfulness? into their everyday practice with their, for themselves and for their clients? Um, I would definitely say the practicing yourself is important. Mm -hmm. um, I try at least a few times a day, just, just for a few moments um, to center myself. I have a, a YouTube clip um, bookmarked on my uh, internet browser. And so, you know, every now and then when I'm finding myself too overwhelmed, I click on that and I, it's, I think it's a three minute clip and I just listen to his voice and I, mm -hmm. I follow his instructions. Um, and so really practicing it and, and feeling the benefit for yourself, yeah. um, you know, as we talked about that parallel process, if I understand the benefit, um, I can then relay that to my client in a more effective way. Yeah, definitely. Any other thoughts about mindfulness that, that we haven't talked about today that 
would be good for our listeners to, to be thinking about or considering. Sometimes it's just a really good excuse to eat some chocolate. <laughs> just pop a Hershey Ab- kiss. Mindfulness right there. There Abs- you go. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for um, taking some time out of your very busy schedule <laughs> to, to join us today and talk a little bit about mindfulness and how you use it in your therapy session with your clients and, and for even for yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining our podcast today, or if you're watching on YouTube, watching us today, uh, we hope you join our webinar here at the end of the month related to this. It'll be the top on the topic of mindfulness. Um, if you haven't already, uh, check out our website at the knowledge center at chaddock.com. You can also find us on social media, on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and, um, YouTube. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Developmental Trauma and Attachment Podcast and Webinar for Clinicians. Be sure to subscribe and follow the Knowledge Center at Chattock on Facebook for future episodes and for more in-depth content from the Knowledge Center. For further resources and training opportunities, please log on to www.theknowledgecenteratchattock.com. We hope to join us again next time.